Hello, my lovely listeners, and welcome to this week's Catamania episode. I think one of the most talked about subjects with my followers that I have is cosmetic procedures. I get a lot of questions from y'all about different you know, cosmetic procedures, my experience. I'm always very open about the stuff that I have done. I don't hide it. And I honestly answer any questions that you have, but I do answer them from my personal experience rather than any actual medical background because I don't have any medical background. So I finally found a board certified plastic surgeon that I could talk to, that I could ask questions from you and from myself that I was curious about, Dr. Joseph Milley. Dr. Milley is a plastic surgeon in San Francisco Bay Area, someone who has been practicing medicine in that field for quite some time, and someone who's honestly a wealth of knowledge. We covered a lot of ground in this episode, and we still didn't cover everything I wanted to cover. But the most important questions that y'all wanted me to ask him, uh, I did my best to ask, and I know that you will find a lot of value in this episode. We chatted about everything from breast augmentation, certain risks with implants, Uh, risks just with surgery in general, to rhinoplasties, and fillers and Botox in the end. As per usual, if you enjoy this episode and you enjoy my podcast, please give it five stars, thumbs up, whatever the rating button is on the platform that you're listening to this on. It means more than you know. Enjoy and stay blessed. Welcome to Catamania, Dr. It's Dr. Mele, right? Am I pronouncing uh, that correctly? Say it Mele, but it works every way. Millie. Okay. Is that Italian by chance? It is. Okay. I believe it means apple. Oh, very cool. And where are you from originally? Are you from United States? Were you born and raised there? Yeah, I was born in New York, but I grew up out here in California. So. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Didn't get I haven't very far. Been, I was going to say, I haven't been to New York yet, but from what I hear, uh, California and New York are like kind of two different worlds in terms of lifestyle and whatnot. They're opposites. Yes. Yeah. You Even obviously... as a six-year-old when we moved here, I noticed there was a difference in personality between New York and California. <laughs> Probably more, I guess, kind, at least at first. Uh, I think at first uh, glance. <laughs> New York, I mean, sometimes Californians think, I'm just going to change to this one because the other one keeps yeah. falling out. Good. No New worries. Yorkers tend to be very direct. Yeah. So if they don't like you, It's not like they'll make a big issue of it, but they'll let you know. And it, I, I like it because it gives you a chance to do something about it. Whereas in California, right. they may not let you know. And you might have to find out through someone else. Which seems weird to me, but that's how it works. Yeah, I found that, I mean, my culture, you know, Eastern Europeans, they're known to be a lot more blunt than North Americans. So moving to Canada and especially working in the corporate world for a while there, I found it very almost annoying that people wouldn't tell you face to face what they think that they would smile, but then you would find out some other way, you know, that exactly, maybe you've, exactly. you've done something wrong or whatever, but I guess it's just the culture on the flip side. People are very polite everywhere you go. So I guess that's good. So polite. Yes. <laughs> I think it was always fun to visit Canada because they would apologize when the American dollar wasn't as strong as the Canadian dollar. And I, and I don't think that ever happened to them when they came to the U S I highly doubt it. And I can't believe that that was happening. <laughs> it was definitely good for Canada, not going to lie. Um, I yeah. wasn't there yet when that happened, but it was definitely very good for Canadians. But I know it, Canadians say sorry way too much. And you know what's so funny? I started to say it for a while there. Um, yeah. And I Did remember. Did your family my husband, give you grief? Yes, definitely. They were like, why are you saying sorry? I would go back home and I would go to a restaurant and I would say to the servers, hi, how are you doing today? And my friends would be like, we don't say that here, Christina. You need to cut that out. People think you're weird. Can you imagine? Just trying to be polite. <laughs> exactly. So it's just such a huge difference in culture. And how did you decide to embark on the journey of medicine as a career choice? Is that something you always wanted? It was probably sophomore year in high school. I decided that's what I was going to be. And I looked at all the different things you can be as a doctor. And I think part of the appeal was there were a lot of choices still. So I didn't feel like I was really pigeon pigeonholing myself, even though I wanted to do that very early on. Uh, I will say that surgery was not at the top of my list, uh, mostly because my father is a contractor 
and he built homes for a lot of doctors and lawyers and such. And it gave me a chance to pick their brains of if they liked their job or not, and what they did like, what they didn't like. And most of the surgeons would be unreliable in terms of meetings because they would get called to emergencies and we'd have a meeting plan and then well, they had to go do something else. And I figured, well, that's not really appealing if I want to have a family someday and I want them to be able to count on me to show up when I'm supposed to. But as I got in further into my training, I did a rotation on the orthopedic uh, surgery service, mostly broken bones and such. And the people doing hand surgery were orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, and also trained as plastic surgeons. And then I saw the other things the plastic surgery was doing and the appeal was it's elective surgery. There's really no emergencies. You can plan your day. You can be as busy as you want to or not. Uh, and that was a huge appeal. Plus you still get to do surgery, which for me was the best part of medicine. I mean, getting to do things with my hands and fixing things was awesome. And then with plastic surgery, you could actually see what you did, which was even more awesome. I mean, it's great saving lives. It's great, you know, taking out a spleen that's bleeding or taking out the appendix. But when you're done, it looks the same. It doesn't look better. People don't see the instant, I guess, like reward that you get from it, right? Correct. Maybe the pain yeah, well, goes hard away. To share. But yeah, right. You know, the patient gets the reward right away. <laughs> right. And people come to you voluntarily in a way, most of the time, at least, right? Yes. Yes, I yeah. have a good friend who's a pediatric oncologist, which is a very tough job. I don't think I could do it, but he's very good at it. But once in a while, he'll get angry with me and say, your patients want to come see you like it's a bad thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine most of your patients are in a good mood most of the time. Maybe they're a little bit nervous yeah. here and there, but they're there voluntarily and they're looking to get a really good result in the end. So it's just, no. I guess, for lack of a better word, the vibe of it is probably better than in most other medicine fields. Is that kind of how it is? It's a great vibe because there's usually something we can offer and can do. Mm -hmm. And I've been at this long enough. There was no internet when I first started with the advent of the internet. It's a double-edged sword, but I think overall it's helped because people come in with some sort of idea what we can do and what we can't do and a lot less uh, sort of unrealistic uh, aims are being presented to me at the first consultation. So it's been a good thing. Would you say that with the rise of social media, you have had a rise in procedures that are being requested? Uh, I think there's been like more of a rise in some of the more trendy procedures that kind of come and go. But for the stuff we do every day, you know, breast augmentation, eyelids, noses, we, we do those every day. We've always done those every day. We're still doing them every day. I don't think that's really shifted very much. But some of the procedures like uh, Brazilian butt lifts, we weren't really doing that when I started. It became kind of more popular. And it's kind of, I think it's kind of plateaued to where, you know, we're doing it for the people who need it, who can benefit from it. And we're doing it in a non-Kardashian method. So it's not too extreme. It actually is more to balance the butt rather than to make an enormous butt. Uh, I think those social media does play into uh, sometimes for good and sometimes not so good, but it gives me a chance to explain it when they come in, you know, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense and what'll work, what doesn't work. Right. I, I don't know if you saw that movie a while back. I think it came out during COVID um, social dilemma. And they were talking about how different surgeons, I guess, across the country were reporting that, um, some women come in and they ask to have, it was more so, I guess, in regards to fillers, but mm. they were asking to look like an Instagram filter. Have you ever had sure. that? Uh, I have, but I can't really do it. So I just explained that pretty straightforward. Though I did have the converse. I had a young woman who came in for eyelid surgery and afterwards she healed very well. And her friends kept asking her what filter she was using. Oh, wow. Very interesting. It's, like it's, it's an interesting world. It's the world. Dr. Mealy filter. It's the doc <laughs> I went to this doctor to get this filter. Exactly. It cost a little bit more than, uh, you know, your yeah. regular Instagram filter to build. But yeah, that's very, it's, it's an interesting subject. I think a lot of people are kind of also curious about it because of how intense. I mean, I also noticed yeah. the trend in those filters got... Um, it's a little bit more on the natural end of things these days. Like, sure. you know, before women would use filters that a lot of women would use filters on social media that would alter their face structure completely. And yeah, now like really strong cheekbones or tins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And nowadays I find 
it's a little bit more towards the natural end of things, a little bit more. Like I wouldn't say yeah. it's still, you know, there, but um, yeah, it's an interesting well, there conversation. Are, there are certain rules to beauty. Uh, there are certain ratios that we find attractive. So filters it would be very simple to write a filter that's going to enhance a face. Um, yes. But it'd be also very simple to distort it if you don't know what the rules are. Exactly. So this is something else I wanted to touch on. I guess it's the Fibonacci sequence, right? That golden ratio. And if our audience mm -hmm. doesn't know what it what it what it is, I highly encourage y'all to Google it because it's fascinating. It occurs it everywhere really in nature, right? Everything that we find beautiful to our eyes. Yeah, has like your perfect that... rectangle. It's one to one point six one eight. I mean, it's it's the golden ratio. Yeah, the spiral progresses at the golden ratio. Do you use then the golden ratio in your surgeries when you do like, you know, facial reconstruction? And do you find that most people don't have that naturally or do have that naturally? How does that work? Sure. So I think in general, the people who tend to be more attractive are closer to those ratios, but the ratios like the perfect number is not always perfect. Uh, for example, with the mouth, a little larger than the ratio tends to be more attractive. And the same with eyes, but it's all over the place. It's the difference. I, I gave a talk for a bunch of uh, cosmetic dentists. I was wondering like, what can I talk to cosmetic dentists about? I, I don't do dentistry, but the golden ratio comes up there too. So the ratio between the lateral incisor, and the central incisor is that same ratio. Very interesting. So, so it's not just your whole face. It's, it's, it's the whole I face and the parts of, of the your face. And, yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. And what would you say is the most common procedure that you do? Uh, probably breast augmentation, just because it's the most demanded. Is it the well, most demanded sort of all over the world or in the United States? or? Uh, definitely in the United States. Uh, all over the world, liposuction might edge it out, but it's pretty close to it's either one or two consistently year after year. And what's the most complex surgery or the most difficult one to do? <laughs> I think the hardest to do is not both technically and also expectation wise is rhinoplasty. Hmm. I had a rhinoplasty. So this is really interesting. Yeah. And because a millimeter makes a difference on a nose. I mean, if one nipple is a millimeter higher than the other, we call that perfect. I mean, that's usually there are 10 millimeters off and no one notices, but a nose, if it was 10 millimeters off, everyone would notice. Yeah, absolutely. I want to come back to rhinoplasties in just one second. But sure. let's talk about breast augmentation, considering that's something that you do m most often. It's the most, sure. the most, I guess, um, common surgery that you do. Can you sort of explain the procedure itself and different implants and in which case one implant is better than the other? How does all of that work? Sure. No, it's great to have options, uh, but they do cause a lot of confusion. And again, with the Internet, people have access to what these options are. And sometimes they'll come in and ask for a very specific type of breast augmentation. And I kind of have to back up and ask them, why are we doing it that way? What are the, what are your goals? Because as a plastic surgeon, if someone comes in and tells me, you know, I want a certain size, I can figure out what implant we need to do that and how that will fit on their body. But when they come in and say, I want a certain implant, then if I put all the other rules together with that implant, often it's someone asking for a high profile implant, but they don't want to be too big. And high profile implants are sort of the way to maximize the amount of volume you're putting on a narrow chest. So I tell them, oh, you want a 600 cc implant? They're like, absolutely not. I go, then you don't want a high profile implant. Uh, but the, it's nice to have those options because if someone has a wider chest or a narrower chest, obviously we need a bigger volume on a wider chest. But for an implant to look appropriate on a chest, it needs to be about the same width as the breast, just a little bit narrower. So someone with a wider chest who wants to be smaller, I would still use a wide implant, but just lower profile so we have less volume. And as someone who's sort of pushing maximum density, then we use the ultra high profile. Uh, but usually I'm using those for folks who are smaller, who have a narrower chest, and we're still in that you know, 300, 400 you know, cc range. Uh, and it, it can look appropriate on their chest. But again, with anything else, if it gets too big, it becomes too obvious. Right. And when you say high profile, what do you mean exactly? So if you think about the shape of the implant, if you keep the diameter the same and make it taller and taller, that's a higher and higher profile. Mm. So you can think of a low profile might have you know, 300, 200, 300 cc's in it. That would match a chest that's 12, 13 centimeters wide. 
a high profile implant could go all up to 700 in that range, maybe even 800. So you can, you can double easily double the volume of an implant by changing the profiles. And, and there's different stuffings too. So we have, you know, silicone and we have saline as our internal structures. Saline doesn't provide much support. It's basically water with a tiny bit of salt. So most of the shape comes from the shell and it requires a certain amount of pressure to fill that shell up. So the saline implants tend to feel a little more firm. They have, since they have less structure inside, they tend to wrinkle a little bit more. So someone with very thin skin, you know, a silicone implant might provide a better cosmetic result. But if someone has, say they're a B cup going to a C, you may not be able to tell the difference between the two of them because there's enough breast tissue to cover it. But the, the uh, silicone implants have changed dramatically since they were first invented. So they came about in the 1960s. They were very cohesive. Uh, the implants were shaped and they had little patches on the back to keep them from spinning from because they were smooth. So the problem with the patches were they were so firmly attached that the implants would move and they would break at that point. And uh, so then they changed them to no patches, but round implants because round implant, they can spin around and it doesn't change shape. But gravity tends to keep most of the volume at the bottom. And uh, frankly, I use mostly round implants still today. The In an attempt to make things softer, they used thinner and thinner silicone. So it was almost like an oil. And that became a problem if there was a leak because the oil would get out of the implant and then potentially out of the capsule, the scar that's around the implant and cause lumps and bumps and, and real disasters. So the trend was back in about 94 to make them more cohesive again and also to improve the quality of the silicone and the toughness of the shell. Older implants, the gel could actually bleed through the shell like helium coming out of a balloon, whereas the newer implants have very low bleed, so very little silicone can get out of the implant without a physical hole in it. So the latest have been these gummy bear implants. Basically, they're very cohesive implants. If you were to cut them in half, they kind of keep their shape. They, they would just be like two halves. Uh, and the advantage of that is if it does break, because they can still break, uh, the gel tends to stay where it's put. So it tends not to migrate and end up moving around in the body. Uh, it's harder to tell there's a leak since it doesn't flatten like a saline implant. So an MRI or high definition ultrasound might be needed to check on them once in a while to make sure they're okay. Uh, the saline, you don't have to because when it leaks, it just goes flat. Does one, does saline or silicone look more natural? Like do, do, do some, are some of them better in terms of the natural look? It really depends on the breast that they're going in. So if someone's very flat and have very little tissue, I think in terms of how they feel and move, probably silicone gives us a better cosmetic result. Unless someone's looking for those real like half a coconut, really you know obvious implants that are very round at the top of the bottom, well, then saline will do that. And you can get actually more projection with the saline because the back tends to be a little bit round too. The silicone implants tend to be pretty flat in the back, so they're more like a, a half a dome. And those tend to look a little more natural. There are shaped implants. Uh, I'll use those sometimes for reconstruction because after a mastectomy, the lower part of the breast is much tighter than the upper part. And we're really trying to work to get that lower part expanded. So we may use a tissue expander to try and stretch it out and then replace it with a shaped implant. But the shaped implants, they can rotate. And that's a problem because you don't want the big end being sideways and making it look like you're laying down when you're standing up. So those tend to be textured. Uh, texturing has its own issues associated with it, but the texturing is there to try and get the scar to attach to the implant to keep it from spinning, to keep it from rotating. Uh, texturing has also been associated with a rare tumor, the ALCLs, the breast implant associated lymphoma. It's not a true breast cancer, but it does form around uh, an implant. We don't know if it's causal. We don't know if the implant's causing it or if it just lets us know that it's there sooner. Uh, there's been maybe a thousand cases now reported worldwide, so not very many. Almost all of them have been around textured implants. There's been a few around smooth implants, but almost all of those patients had had textured implants in the past. At this point, I think there's maybe one case of smooth implants that has developed it, but it's very rare. It can cause a lot of fluid to form around an implant, so one breast gets much larger than the other, and that tends to make it easier to diagnose. And normally what we would do is take some of that fluid out, send it for special stains to see if there's a, any bad cells in there. I've seen a few patients with seromas around their implants that showed up, you know, years later, almost always textured, but almost always someone working out really hard and just getting the seroma because they're moving the implant within the capsule. Uh, I still haven't found a case myself with the ALCL, but I will keep looking. But Very it's rare. Interesting. I, mean, I mean, the breast cancer is one in eight. If you live to 80, uh, these are probably one in 30,000. So pretty rare. 
Interesting. And so in terms of workout, can you do chest still after you get a, a breast augmentation surgery? You can. Can you train your chest? Uh, mm-hmm. Some women find it uncomfortable, especially if they have larger implants and real strong muscles, because when you flex, especially exercises like bench press or push-ups, the implants tend to go out and they tend to get pulled up by the pectoralis major muscle if they're behind the muscle. Uh, for patients who I have who are bodybuilders who are posing, often we'll put the implant in front of the muscle to try and decrease the amount of movement they get when they're flexing on stage because they'll lose points. Uh, but also it's much more obvious, especially for a bodybuilder who's leaning out for their show. It's going to be very obvious they have an implant. Yeah, it's a whole other look. Yeah. Do you ever have anyone come in and say, I want it to look fake? Like I want people to see. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't like doing that. So if they don't tell me that, they're not going to get it. Mm. And even if they want it, I will have to talk to them about it. Like, Because I want to know why. And what is the goal? Do they want to look like someone or do they have a certain look that they've seen that they like? Uh, Because most of the time, most of my patients are women who've had kids or wetting their breasts back and they want to look normal. They don't want to look extreme. They're not really trying to make a statement with their breasts. Sometimes younger patients will be more that way. Mm. They're just trying to make more of a statement and they just want bigger. I see. And let's go back to breast implants. You said they could rip or they could... Sure. Yeah, they can yeah. wear out just like everything else that's you know made by people. Uh, right. Alien implants, if they tear, even a small hole will let all the water out. So those, those are pretty easy. Other thing that can happen with them is sometimes the valve will fail, and that will just let all the water out. So it's not dangerous. The saline gets absorbed just like you drank extra water, uh, but it does ruin the augmentation because all that volume is gone. The silicone implants, if they're before 1985, the gels are very, very liquid-like, uh, and they can really be a problem. So those, if they leak, you want to get to it right away before it you know, gets out of the shell. I think the ratio was like maybe, uh, maybe 14%. So if someone has a leak around an older implant from before 1985, about 14% of those people per year will get the gel getting outside of the shell and causing more lumps and bumps and problems. The newer implants, they're, they're pretty good. Uh, the silicone that's inside of them is fairly cohesive. The amount of gel migration we've seen since the newer implants has dropped off dramatically. Uh, I wish I could say zero. I just don't think we've been following them long enough to know. Uh, but I can tell you, Sientra implants, for example, 500,000 have been placed in the last 12 years. There's been three cases reported of gel migration. Uh, two of them were in patients who had previous implants that had ruptured, most likely had the gel before. The third one is a social media post, which I don't think anyone's gotten any additional information on, but that's really low. The older implants, it was pretty common. And the ones before 85, it was about 50%. So it's fairly safe. Like it's a fairly safe procedure. It is. The strange thing to me is breast implants are the most investigated medical device. I mean, we put machines in people that shock their heart to keep them going, have not been investigated as much as a breast implant. And it's a pretty simple device. Basically, it's a silicone shell with a filling inside of it. Uh, But especially in the U.S., there's a lot of controversy around it. Uh, Through our FDA uh, and just social media in general, there are some people who feel like implants are not safe. Uh, They feel like it makes them sick. They feel like their hair is falling out. They're fatigued. Uh, So they they have all these not very specific symptoms, but they attribute it to their breast implants. And mm-hmm. some people have their implants removed, feel better afterwards. So I don't can't tell you if it's a physical thing because we don't have a test where we can just say, hey, go get this test and we'll know if your implants are making you sick. Uh, but I can tell you the majority of the patients that I've seen, like some of them get better. Most of them feel the same. Some of them feel the same and then they're sad and they want their implants back. So we'll put them back in. Uh, but I've had a lot of folks who have these sort of generalized symptoms who also have hypothyroidism that hasn't been diagnosed, who had a, a patient who had mercury poisoning because they went on this crazy fish diet and all they ate were fish. Uh, that does not get better by removing the implants. So I think anyone who has those symptoms and needs to see the doctor, needs to get a full workup, needs to have a you know a, a battery of tests to figure out why they're fatigued, why their hair is falling out. And I think anyone who wants their implants out deserves to have their implants out. I have no issue with that. I will guarantee them that their breasts will be smaller, but I can't really guarantee them anything else. I can't guarantee they'll feel better or their hair will grow thicker. 
Uh, but there is a small percentage who get better. The other thing that's really interesting is you'll find people online who do these radical on-block resections to get rid of the implant and all the tissue that's ever touched the implant in order to completely cure them. There was a study done by a couple of the uh, Aesthetic Society members here in the U.S. where they had patients who came in with these sort of complaints. They had their whole workup, couldn't find a physical reason for it, had the implants removed. Some of them just had the implant removed. Some of them had some of the capsule removed too. Some of them had all of the capsule removed. And some of them had these um, block resections. In each of those groups, the same percentage of people felt better. Mm. So a bigger operation did not provide bigger benefit. I wonder if maybe people get kind of hung up on the idea of the fact that they have like a foreign object in their body. And sure. the the idea and the thought of it starts to kind of mess with them. I don't know. That's just kind of a speculation that no, I, I can think of. Think about the 90s. So the mid 90s, the US FDA restricted the use of implants. Mm -hmm. um, there were concerns it was causing cancer, lupus, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, all these connective tissue disorders. Uh, turned out that that's not true in the long run. But at the time, you know, people were not convinced. A lot of women had their silicone, imp their silicone implants removed. Some of them had them replaced with saline. Uh, there were a lot of people very distressed, especially if they had their augmentation that they enjoyed removed. And now they looked flatter than they remember. And the implant kind of squishes the breast tissue against the skin, so they may actually be smaller than they were before. Or they get saline implants, and now they have rippling and problems, so cosmetically it wasn't as good. It caused a lot of distress. And people were willing to do that because they were concerned their implants might be causing them some health issue. Uh, I think mm -hmm. our FDA could have done a better job by not scaring everyone and recommending that they not be used for everything, uh, but that's, that's kind of what happened. The really annoying part for me was the first American Society of Plastic Surgery meeting I went to was in Washington, D.C. It was a few blocks away from the FDA. It was right after they restricted the use of these implants. And no one from the FDA would come to our meeting and explain why. Hmm. It was very sad. They were, they were, as the head of, or the president of the ASPS, or at that time it was the ASPRS, said uh, they were conspicuous by their absence. Hmm. So, very interesting. And there were, there were from some very junky trials, too. There was a study showing uh, a group of women with implants who were younger were compared to a group of women without implants who were older. And younger women tend to have rheumatoid arthritis. They tend to have scleroderma. They tend to have lupus in higher numbers because it's a deadly disease. So if you count an older population, some of those people are no longer around to be counted. So when you compare older and younger women, younger women have more rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma and lupus. They also happen to be the group that had the implants. So the FDA says, oh, look, implants are causing trouble. Look at this study. And the plastic surgeon are looking at the study saying, the control is no good. You need to control for age. And when the studies were repeated and controlled for age, they showed no difference. But it scared mm -hmm. a lot of people. I think we have well, a lot of trust in, in the FDA and everything related to anything medical, right? It's sort of the authority. Yeah. And I think we often maybe forget that that's people. That's just people deciding those things, people. right? Doing research and stuff like that. But so many more things need to be factored in when. Well, what's interesting like is the stuff. subcommittees who are the actual scientists have always approved implants. It just seems the main body of the FDA seemed to have the biggest problem with it. And even this last round, whenever. So they put together a group to investigate breast implants with zero plastic surgeons in the group. Seems odd. They did include several doctors who had published large volumes on how horrible breast implants are, rheumatologists, mm. dermatologists. That group could not find anything wrong with implants. So that makes me feel very good that implants are safe. Okay. Despite their trials of finding something wrong, it still took them 14 years or so to put them back on the market in an unrestricted form. And even after that was done, the head of the FDA still wrote a letter saying that we shouldn't have approved breast implants, even though the science was pretty clear. Hmm. Very interesting subject. Um, I want to just quickly ask you, because I know it's a, such a, I guess, point of interest for everybody when it comes to implants, what causes them exactly to rip or, you know, malfunction, so to speak? And, you know, it's kind of, you, you said it, you mentioned the saline ones, they just sort of deflate. So you yeah. would know that something happened because basically your boob deflated. It's gone. Exactly. Yeah. 
How would you know if it's silicone and what causes for that to happen? Sure. So I think just like every, everything else in the world, eventually they can wear out. Okay. So there's going to be a, a percentage of patients who have some massive trauma, you know, a car accident or fall on the corner or something. It's pretty obvious why they broke. But I'd say the majority of them have silent ruptures, which means the implant, when we move our arm sort of up in this area, the implant may be folding and folding and folding and folding and over the years. It may eventually crack and open. Uh, sometimes there's a manufacturing defect, but that's pretty rare. I mean, I, I I've look, heard of implants a lot of getting implants. recalled. Well, I've, I've heard I've a lot of implants. I've only found one that was actually defective. And okay. I always bring three just in case. But the first one was defective, and then I only had two, and I was very careful with the other two. Uh, but I think the quality control is good on the manufacturing. Uh, the only ones I use are the FDA-approved ones, so it's Sientra, Allergan, and Mentor, and they all they all have good quality control in their in their products. But sometimes things just wear out, you know. And I have to tell all my patients: breast implants are not lifetime devices. You may live longer than your breast implant survives, which is a good thing. Uh, but you may need to have it replaced or removed if you're done with it. Okay. And how long usually is the lifespan of an implant? They tend to leak more as they get older. So, you know, initial three years, deflation rates are probably 0.7%, I think, on the, on the newer studies. Uh, as they get older, they're more likely to deflate. Um, so I would think it would make, might go up just in general, like 1% per year after that. So a 10 years, probably a 10% chance. Okay. And then 20 years, it might be more than 20%, though. Okay. And then you're asking, how do you tell? Because the shape may not change, uh, especially with the newer implants, the really the very cohesive ones. The best way to tell is either with an MRI or with a high, uh, uh, high not high density, but uh, high definition ultrasound. But you have so to have a good technologist. So would you recommend getting them from so time our, to time? Our FDA has recommended getting an MRI now at five years. And then every three or four years after that, initially it was three years and every two years. So they've, they've lightened up on it. That's a whole other story. You probably don't want to know all the details of, but the FDA was trying to prevent silent leaks with the older implants. When they leaked, then they would migrate and really cause trouble with the advent of these cohesive. We don't really have the problems with the silent leaks. So what we're trying to prevent is less existent, I would say. Uh, and it's not hundred percent accurate. So MRIs are 90% accurate in studies where people are being sent because their plastic surgeon thinks there's a problem. With the FDA recommendation, like everyone who has implants, they want to have it done. So you'd expect it to be less accurate. And with 90% means like one in 10 will get the wrong diagnosis. And when we're doing 400,000 breast dogs a year, that's 40,000 people might be told they have a leak when they don't or don't have a leak when they do. And if you told you have a leak when you don't, you're going to have surgery you don't need. Mm, ouch. Yeah. And so in that case, if you, let's say you, you're living with an implant, you got a surgery and it's been, you know, two years, Yeah. it rips, you don't feel it. Everything looks fine. Is that a possibility? Like it rips, you don't That's feel possible. it. And then you live with it for two years. Is that dangerous? Until you get, you know, another MRI or, or scan or whatever it is to detect it. No, it's a really, really good question. So, I mean, if there's a change in shape, yeah, we, we kind of lower our threshold in terms of maybe getting an MRI sooner. Uh, in terms of if it's dangerous, if the gel migrates, so if it's the older implants, the gel migrates, the biggest danger was the body would try to wall it off. So just like if you get a splinter under your skin, the body tries to grow scar around it to protect you from that. It does the same thing with the breast implant, which is really beneficial because it keeps the implant from moving. So we make that little wall of scar around it to keep it from moving. It's only a problem if it gets too tight or thick, then it can make the breast feel hard. But you can imagine if the gel gets outside that capsule, the body now recognizes there's something foreign there and wants to put a scar around it. With the newer implants, since the gel doesn't really move, it's usually not getting outside of that scar. So it's as far as it being dangerous, it probably isn't in the fact that it's not going to cause a lot of physiological changes. On the other hand, you, if you've got an implant that has gel that's not contained, it's going to be easier for that gel to get out. So a more minor trauma might even be enough to get the gel outside of that pocket and then cause that process of lumps and bumps. So if someone we know has 
a, a implant that's ruptured, we definitely want to change it. Now, it's not something you have to do the same day, but you want to get to it within a few weeks or months at the, at the latest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And last question that I want to ask on breast implants, and then I want to move on mm -hmm. quickly to noses. What about the breast implant illness that everybody always talks about? Breast implant illness? Yeah, that's what we were talking about. So as far as people having these symptoms that are very vague and generalized, it's hard to know what's going on in that situation. Um, okay. It, it could be purely psychological. Just, you know, if we worry about something long enough, we can have somatic symptoms from that. Uh, but there may be something to it. There's a lot of research going on. Uh, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons has been working on it for about 20 years. Uh, that and the ALCL even longer because we don't want to do things that hurt our patients. You know, right. If there's some test that we could develop that would tell us that it's happening, I'd be the first person to be offering it. Because that yeah. would be a nice thing to be able to do. But there um, isn't really a confirmation that you could do or a test. You don't have a confirmatory to... test. Yeah. But right. there are people who are very clearly feeling like their implants are causing their problems. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same problem we have whenever there's lots of people with a certain condition and lots of kind of folks with generalized symptoms. We kind of want to associate them because both of them are very common. Um, but it's very hard in that situation to find a link or find a test or find something that says, yes, you have it because the majority of people with implants don't have these symptoms. Mm -hmm. So okay. why not? You know, we don't know. Very interesting. Let's move on to noses. How okay. often do you do rhinoplasties and what are the different types of rhinoplasties that you do? And in which case would you recommend them or not recommend them to patients? I yeah, so rhinoplasty again, there, it's, but... <laughs> it's a much lower, uh, for fewer people are asking for rhinoplasties. Uh, probably the most common thing that's done is just removing a bump or narrowing the tip. You know, sort of, those are probably the common things that we that's do. That's what I had. Most I noses. had the bump. The and bump. They, well, I had a bump and then my tip was kind of like brought in a little bit to make it smaller, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and that's really common. Uh, and there's... There's three main structures that give support to the nose. There's the bone and then there's a couple of cartilages. So the bone is what usually causes the bump. And then the cartilage, the upper cartilage tends to follow that pattern. The lower cartilages are the ones that give us the shape of the tip and go around the ala, around the, the nostrils to give us shape. Uh, those are usually what we're modifying. Uh, there mm -hmm. are some rhinoplasties where we go the other direction. So I have Asian patients with very flat uh, a nose between their eyes and they want some definition there. Uh, so we may have to add cartilage or, or an implant in order to give them back definition in that area. Uh, most Caucasian noses, especially European noses, we're usually doing more reduction than augmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, but Asian, we tend to do a fair amount of augmentation. Uh, but the, sh the nose skin is also very different. So Asian noses tend to have very thick skin. So the things I'm doing inside, I need to be more dramatic and exaggerated with. Because you can make a very fine structure, but you throw a quilt over it and you can't really see what that structure is anymore. Whereas if someone has very thin skin, then everything has to be very precise because you're going to see those cartilages through their nose. Very interesting. It just seems like such a complicated... I mean, breast augmentations and all the other plastic surgeries are very complex as well to me, especially I'm not, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a surgeon. Yeah. But the noses, it just looks so... I don't know. So hard because you, when well, there's you the have inside and the outside, so you can yeah. make the shape, but you still have to have the opening inside to breathe through. Yes. And I can tell you, I've had patients with pretty messed up noses that I did a nice job cosmetically, but they're happier about breathing. Mm. They'll wake up after surgery and like, I can breathe through my nose. Like it's a great thing to be able to do. If you've not been able to do it for, for your whole life and then suddenly you can, it's an amazing gift to go to give to someone. Yeah. So when I have someone absolutely. comes in, it's like, I don't care how small my nose has to be. Even if I can't breathe through it, it's like, oh, you will care. You will yeah. not like that. So to it be has to function you, first. Oh, a hundred percent. And to be honest with you, I, I, I think I took breathing through my nose so for granted until I had my nose surgery and I couldn't breathe yeah. for like four weeks. It's all swollen up. Yeah. Oh my God. It was awful. And it wasn't painful at all. I, I can't no, recall it's not any usually. pain. Yeah, it wasn't painful, but it was ridiculously uncomfortable. I always tell yeah. people who are asking me about it, try to 
plug your nose completely for four yeah. weeks and live like that. And then, and then, and then you'll feel what it's like to go through a rhinoplasty. Yeah. I did have a complication and that's something that I also wanted. One of my followers asked a question in the Q and A box. I think we covered a lot of questions mm -hmm. regarding breast augmentation during our yeah, conversation. Probably more than but you wanted to know about them. <laughs> well, it's such a fascinating <laughs> subject though. And so many people are interested in it. And I get asked a lot. I'm very open about all the procedures that I've done, but I'm like, mm -hmm. I can tell you my experience. I have no idea on the medical side of things, how it's supposed to work, you know, because yeah. obviously I'm not, I'm not a surgeon. I don't work in that field, but I can just tell you about my experience, but it would be really nice to chat with somebody who really knows like the back end of things, you know? Yeah. yeah. So um, I had a complication which caused my nose to basically start healing to the side. So yes. I wore a cast for one week. Then I went in, um, my surgeon removed my cast, saw that my nose was healing basically crooked, which is something yeah. that one of my followers is experiencing now after two yeah. weeks of the surgery. And so she took the cast, she saw it, and she said, this is going to hurt, but mm. I have to put your bone back into place. So mm. she basically put the bone back into place without any anesthesia. It only sure. lasted like two minutes. Like it wasn't yeah, so it hurts bad. hurts for a second. Yeah, it hurt really bad. Though. That was, <laughs> I would say that was the worst part of the whole experience because that yeah. actually hurt. She put it back into place and then she said, you have to wear a cast for another week. She put the cast back on. I wore it. Then I went in. Um, a week later. So that was two full weeks of wearing the cast. She took it off and she said, you're good to go. And then I went back to work, um, you know, was living more or less normal life. I still couldn't blow my nose because it was only three weeks. I think I couldn't blow my mm -hmm. nose for like six weeks or so, four or six weeks. Yeah. And then I was at work one day, I think it was like three and a half weeks post-operation. And I was looking at myself in the mirror and I'm like, I think my nose is cricket. Uh-oh. So I took a few pictures, I sent it to her and she said, immediately come into my office. So sure. I went in and she's like, I'm going to have to do it again. And I'm going to have to put the cast back on for another week. She's like, she basically told me that within the first six weeks, you can still do some things from yeah. the outside to fix it. So she did it again. She put the cast back on my, um, you know, wish to be a little bit more inconspicuous about the fact that I got a rhinoplasty at work. It didn't quite work. because <laughs> Makes it harder. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it harder when you have a cast on your nose, but that's okay. Um, everybody was very supportive. And then a finally, cast. she had a, yeah, full, like a full, yeah. I don't know, nice. a full cast that, that I had post-operation. Um, so I worked for another week and then I went back in, she took it off and she said, you're good to go. Like your nose is going to be straight. Good. I do have something that sort of grew over here. There's like yep. a tiny little bump that you can see yeah, yeah. from the side. She said, if you want, you can come in and I can remove it in the office. Yeah. Uh, but again. it's not a big deal. It's not messing with my breathing, nothing like that. So I guess this is a, you know, a personal story. But the question that I have for you is, in which case do you know that this isn't swelling in the first little while? Because, you know, my, the follower yeah. of mine who asked that question um, she says, I'm confused. Is it swelling or is it, is it my nose just being crooked? My first instinct is just go to your surgeon. But yeah. what if the surgeon doesn't see it and the surgeon is confused? Is that possible? How do you know? No, there are some times when the swelling will disguise what's going on deeper. Yeah. So, and people, you know, different people swell differently. So if there's a lot of swelling there, you may not be able to tell it's a little bit off till the swelling goes away. I would say overall revision rates on noses are high. It's 15, 20%. And that's in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing. That's just mm. not, that's not like all comers. That's people who just do noses or, you know, really are skilled with noses. Most of the revisions are, are minor, like a little bump on the dorsum. Sometimes when it heals, we'll get a callus, which is a, a fancy word for a little scar on the bone that'll make a bump. And usually it's at that transition between the bone and the cartilage. And it's very simple to go in there and smooth it down, but it's inconvenient. You're swollen again. So we'd rather not have to do that. Uh, right. Sometimes as the scar heals, after six weeks or so, we're making quite a bit of scar in there. If it makes more on one side than the other, it can move the tip of the nose. And then we're casting it, trying to move it back, doing massages. But sometimes that means going back in there and repositioning the cartilage. So that's Ouch. why I find, I think noses are one of the more challenging things we do. Because technically it's difficult. Uh, but the healing makes it even more difficult because again, a millimeter makes a difference. If your nose is off by a millimeter, you don't have to be a plastic surgeon to notice that. Right. Well, and you stare at it. It's like my nose is the first thing I look at 
on my face well, after yeah. my surgery, right? But you'd probably stare at it in the mirror closer than you'd let, allow anyone to stand in front of you. Or not to mention a selfie camera. Like if you flip a, yeah. do a selfie camera and you're already yeah. distorted. I always tell people a selfie camera is not they what you distort. actually look like. You don't yeah. look like that, right? It distorts oh, and they blow up your, nose. your face. Your nose looks bigger than it is. But yeah. especially, you know, when you go in to fix your nose, that's all you notice. And you just, you pay such close attention to every little yeah. detail that, yeah, every millimeter counts for sure. I think noses and ears are the two that my patients stare at and drive themselves crazy for a while until it finally settles down and then they're, then they're comfortable with it. Because with ears, if I turn my head this far, you can't see my other ear. Mm -hmm. So you pretty much have to be straightforward to see both ears. But that's the view we get in the mirror. So mm -hmm. every patient, when they look in the mirror, they see both their ears at exactly the same time. And if one's slightly out more than the other, it's a problem. Yeah. So with, with ears too, revision rates are not as high as noses, but you sometimes have to go back and just tweak it a little bit so that people can be happy. But no one else in the world sees that. And with ears, so I had a patient who is a tennis player. Young woman, tennis player, had to put her hair up to play tennis, hated it because her ears stuck literally straight out. She tells all of her teammates, I'm getting my ears fixed. And all of her teammates are like, what's wrong with your ears? It's like, they stick straight out. Like, oh, okay. Didn't bother her teammates. We do her surgery. Everything turns out very well. We take off the dressings. It looks great. She's super happy. So I tell her now, don't be angry at your teammates if they don't notice. She's mm. like, how can they not notice? They were straight out. Now they're beautiful. Comes back a couple of weeks later. Yeah, nobody noticed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because ears, nobody looks at ears except right. for the patient. But the patient looks at them a lot. And it may interfere with how they wear their hair or where they want to go or if they want to be in a breeze or want to go swimming. You know, it's nice to be able to get rid of that worry for them. But I always have to reassure them like they're the only ones worrying about it. Right. Well, it's often like that with everything. Like I can't remember how many people told me, you don't need a rhinoplasty. You don't need a rhinoplasty. And I'm like, sure. I need a rhinoplasty. Maybe you don't you know, see it, but for me, yeah. for, I need a rhinoplasty. So yeah. that's something that I also wanted to chat with you about. Uh, one of my followers also asked a question. And it's kind of an interesting one. So I thought mm -hmm. I would definitely bring it up. Should people seek, it's kind of funny, but should people seek therapy prior to deciding to go for a plastic surgery and how does your psychological and I guess mental aspect of looking at a potential surgery play into play into the whole process the reason why I'm saying it's funny because sure. I definitely didn't think that when I went in for any but, of my surgeries but then when I got I think if somebody question, is thinking that they probably should yeah yeah because that's okay. not usually people's first thought for people's first thought is like something's too big too small I just want it fixed yes and it's sometimes difficult, even as an experienced plastic surgeon, to sort out who probably should talk to somebody other than a surgeon before surgery or not. Right. Uh, there's an acronym for men having rhinoplasty that we call a Simon. So Simon is usually a single, immature male who's narcissistic and obnoxious. Mm -hmm. And those are tip-offs that they may not be a happy patient after surgery, no matter what the result. They may have a beautiful result, but they're still not going to be happy. And the reason for that is there's, there's some people, they're just obnoxious. That's just right. the way they are. Uh, they tend to offend people. They may not be able to have good relationships because of that, but they blame it on the bump on their nose. Mm. So they come in and they want the bump on their nose fixed so they can have better relationships. That is not going to happen. That does not right. determine whether you have a relationship or not. And as a surgeon, if I operate on them and I fix the bump on their nose, I've now removed their crutch. They may be very angry at me. Right. For now making it clear it wasn't the bump on their nose. And even though male rhinoplasty patients are one of the smallest numbers of folks that we do stuff for, they were on the high end of the list of people who murdered their plastic surgeons because they were so upset that their crutch was removed. Oh my so God, are you serious? You're right. There are people who should talk to you know, a counselor before having surgery. Right. And, and, and how do you determine that? Do you ask people like, what's the reason you want a surgery when they come in for, for a consult? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Because not, not only do you want to know physically what they want done, but you kind of want to know what their motivation is. You know, if right. they're doing it to preserve a relationship, they should talk to someone besides right. a plastic surgeon because it's not going to work. 
And yeah. if I have a woman and a man who come in together and they don't have a good relationship and it's pretty clear the man is asking for bigger implants than the woman wants, I will separate them. I will talk to the woman and ask them what they want because they have to carry them around. Right. And I will tell them that it will not save their relationship. And if you're doing something for someone who doesn't respect you already, they will respect you even less. And it will become yeah. a bigger problem because now you're not going to respect yourself for doing something you didn't want to do in the first place. And I've had a few yeah. patients like, okay, I'm not doing this. And I actually had one come back a couple of years later because now she wanted to do it for herself. And she goes, I'm really glad you said that to me because I would have done it and I would have hated it. Like, but now I want to do it. I'm going to be happy with it. So, so right. you, the psychological impacts are great. Yeah. No, that makes all the sense in the world. What you said, even, you know, in which cases people should be seeking therapy prior to actually embarking on the journey of getting a, a plastic surgery. So do you turn away quite a few people in, in your practice? I turn away a fair number of people. Uh, sometimes there's just, their goals are just something we can't achieve as surgeons. Uh, you just have to be honest about it and say, you know, that's just not something we can do at this point. Um, right. But, uh, but there are some people who, I mean, they're, psychologically, there's something else going on uh, and that really needs to be addressed. And there are folks who will become upset when you bring that up. Right. You know, they just want what they want and they think it's going to help them. And I right. understand that. I mean, you want people to feel like they're doing surgery for a good reason. It's going to help them. But the, whether to screen every patient or not is something we talk about at a lot of our meetings. And there are little checklist screenings that some people do for every patient to see if it's well, going to be a good outcome or not, or not a good outcome. So I can tell you when someone has a complication and there's a problem and there's something we can fix, that is an easier problem if there's something obvious that's wrong. If someone has a great result, like a perfect result, and they're upset with it, I do not know how to fix that. And right. There's nothing I can do about it. And that's something yeah. I, feel I probably should have picked up on before we did the surgery. But you can't yeah. always tell. Some people, you know, have a good act. They come in like it's all together and then things fall apart after. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. I want to ask one final question that relates to specifically surgeries, and then I want to quickly move on to Botox and fillers, and sure. just kind of your your take on it. Is there, or are there instances when people don't react well to anesthesia? Very rarely. So the okay. anesthetics we use now, uh, they tend to be fast acting. They tend to go away quickly. They tend to have less nausea. Uh, so the like the weird reactions that we'd see sometimes with the inhalation anesthetics or some of the other anesthetics we don't really see. Uh, I had maybe one patient during surgery had some weird reaction. We didn't know what was going on. So I just, I admitted her to the hospital and had them run every allergy test we had on her. We couldn't find anything. She felt fine. She ended up going home. We never figured out what it was, but that's hmm. really rare. Uh, I think also doing it in the proper setting helps. So I do all my surgeries in an accredited surgery center. So there's an anesthesiologist there. He's got all the right monitors to make sure you're breathing and your blood pressure is good and oxygen's good and everything's and you're asleep. All those are very important. Uh, yeah. But that's their job. Especially that's what the they sleep do. part. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. No, because imagine <laughs> doing an entire rhinoplasty under local. Oh my God! No, absolutely no. not. I don't uh, recommend it. it. In no, fact, I don't. I don't do it in private practice. Where I trained in uh, plastic surgery, we would do some under local, and usually it was fine. But you know, like if it's not fine, you have to stop and you can't do it. Right. And that's that's always bad. So yeah, oh, I can't do even imagine. Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, I'll do eyelids I... under local. People do fine with that because you can numb it up well. But it has to be the right person because there's some people right. who, they'll ask for that, and I will not grant them that opportunity. Because I right. know they're not going to sit still long enough for me to get it done. And yeah. someone moving with some sharp object next to their eye could be a real bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's fair. It always fascinated me how, you know, you go into a surgery and there's a whole team of people making sure that you're okay, making sure you're well monitored. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a good feeling, you know, to feel no, we safe usually have when you're five there. people in a room and we have an anesthesiologist and myself, and then we'll have a circulating nurse and a scrub nurse. So the scrub nurse is the one who hands me the instruments, circulating nurse hands us the other stuff. And there's usually one other person in the room getting trained mm. because we need to have replacements for ourselves. Of course. No, makes sense. Let's move on to fillers and Botox. Okay. Um, let, let's, let's talk about 
let's let's talk about Botox first. Um, you know, kind of how does it work? In which case do you recommend it? And is there such thing as preventative Botox? Sure. Yeah, that's that's a controversial one, huh? So it works by stopping the connection between the nerve and the muscle from working. So when you frown, you know, your brain sends an impulse out to the muscles that make us frown, and Botox blocks it, blocks that nerve from being able to transmit that message to the muscle. So you think you're frowning, but nothing happens. So I can frown because you know, I have no Botox right now. I but can I would, frown because I have Botox. I would Botox. do the same thing and yeah. like, nothing would happen if I had Botox. Yeah. And the way that you recover from it is kind of interesting. So those the receptors are blocked. And what happens is the nerve recognizes that it's not getting to do what it wants to do. So it grows new branches that attach to the muscle and make new motor end plates. And then it starts working again. And then on average, it takes about three months. Mm-hmm. But the, the, and the, the disport, the others are the same. They all work at the, the same mechanism. So basically you're just blocking that from, from moving. So the question of prevention, I, I tell my patients if they're not animating, like they're not frowning and everything's perfectly smooth, there's nothing to prevent. It's mm-hmm. already smooth. If you're wrinkling your face and some of it stays, that's where Botox will help. But as far as just trying to Botox things while your collagen and elastin are great and there's nothing you can do to make a wrinkle, I don't think it provides any benefit. You know, there are some patients I treat who have migraines, though I only treat their wrinkles, but apparently I'm also treating their migraines. Uh, Then maybe there's some other reasons to do it. But in terms of just preventing a wrinkle, I mean, if it's not there when you stop moving, it's not there. And I don't think the Botox is going to make it stay away any longer. I mean, eventually what happens is, our collagen and our elastin wear out. So when we frown, it sticks, you know, the skin gets thinned out in those areas. And when that starts happening, then definitely it's, it's helpful and it'll prevent a deeper wrinkle. That makes perfect sense. And I think I, I've never heard anyone explain it better because I've heard even doctors talk about like the preventative aspect of Botox and like, Oh, as soon as you, you know, as soon as you see something, just get yeah. Botox. And it's like, it's, yeah. it's a good advice. I think like if well, you see people thinning, come in and they're like, they're 20 years old and they don't have a wrinkle on their face. I'm like I need to start doing Botox. I'm like, why? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, You're perfect. I can't make you better. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And what about fillers? Um, when it comes to, you know, lip fillers or chin cheek fillers, sure. how does that work? What are some of the best fillers and some of the worst fillers maybe if you have those? Yeah, it's a totally different mechanism. So fillers just go in and take up space. So you can think of it like caulking. You know, you're just putting, you're filling in that area underneath the skin. I think the places it's the most predictable, the easiest to use are sort of the nasolabial folds, you know, these deeper lines that we get as we get older. That area, it's got thicker skin. It's hard to see lumps and bumps from the injectables. Uh, I tend to use the more cross-linked, the thicker uh, hyaluronic acids are still my favorites in those areas because they tend to hold up a little bit better. Hyaluronics are probably the most commonly used fillers. So anything from Juvederm, Restylane, used to call it Perlane, but now it's uh, Restylane Lift. There's all different formulations that are a little bit thicker, a little bit uh, stringier. Uh, It really depends on where you're putting it in terms of which one's going to work the best. I think for some of the more superficial wrinkles that we get, the more traditional fillers tend to be bulky and they tend to leave little lumps. Uh, the newer ones tend to be, I, I don't like to use the word like snot, but they're a little bit stretchier. Uh, so they'll still take up space, but they'll also deform better. So they tend to be better for the more superficial things. I remember transitioning from collagen to hyaluronic acids. So collagen was all we had when I started. It's very hard. It's basically what scar is made out of. So when you inject collagen into someone's lips, they can feel it. And so can their partners. And it only lasted about four weeks. So it was something you would do for an event and then it would Mm. go away. When the hyaluronics first came out, they came out in Sweden and I had a couple of Swedish patients that would go there and get this filler and then they'd come back and get collagen. But when they'd come back, I'd see them for other stuff. I'm like, what is in there? It's soft. It moves. Like, this is great. So they were telling me what it was. I would call people in Sweden and ask them like, you know, when's it coming to the U.S.? So finally a company brought it to the U.S. They were, uh, it being researched by FDA still, so they couldn't talk about it. Uh, but I told them like, as soon as you have this available in the U S I want it. Like I don't jump on bad wagons, but that stuff was like so much better than the collagen. So the first one to the U S was Restylane. 
So as soon as it came, started using it on lips, started using it on wrinkles. And not only the patients, but their partners were telling me, I like this better because when I'm <laughs> kissing on my mate, I don't feel that collagen in there anymore. It's just like lip. Right. So it's, it's been a nice transition. Like a natural. Yeah. yeah. Like for you, that's probably all that's been in existence for your life. But going back to what we had before, it's so much better. So, and I haven't seen it make a giant leap since then. And I think there's little tweaks to it, a little bit firmer, a little bit softer. But uh, you know, if all I had was Restylane, I think I would still get good results and you know, people would be pretty happy with it. No. I remember it looking very unnatural for a while there. Like when I was younger, lip fillers mm. looked awful. And now they do them so well that yeah. well, for the most part, of course, there's, you know, I even had a pretty bad experience once, but for the most part, they do them so naturally looking that yeah. it just, it looks no, so good. Right? Don't overcorrect stuff. I mean, wrinkles mm. are normal especially these, everyone has them. If you don't, it looks really weird. So you don't want right. to overcorrect things. You can always add more. And the same with lips. Like someone comes in, they want giant lips. Like I'll just do one CC and then they can come back in a few weeks and think about what they want to do. And I just don't want to put that much in someone's lips all at once. Nicer thing about with the Hyaluronics too, is you can dissolve it. So there is hyaluronidase, which dissolves it and yeah, helps it go away. Some of the newer, more cross mesh ones, it takes more hyaluronidase and sometimes more than one treatment to get it to go away. But the older ones, the traditional ones that first came out, they tend to just sort of go away all at once, which is kind of a problem if you just have one area that you want, you know, shrunk, because uh, you put it in there and it just dissolves it all. So What's your opinion on stillage? That's my favorite well, one that I've gotten. I, I, ha well, I don't, I haven't used it. Okay. So I have, I have okay. no opinion. Okay. Fair enough. What do you like about it? What makes it better? It looks, first of all, it stays, I found it stays the longest. I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe it's just the way it was injected or what it was. I don't know, but it stays the longest. And if it's done right, which I have had it done not the right way. And it just clumped a little bit. Like I had oh, round spots. It migrates, it was, yeah. yeah, it was not nice. Uh, but if it's done right, it looks really, really good. Better than the, better than Juvederm that I mm -hmm. got before. And I found it better than Restylane too. However, I will say, I don't think that I necessarily got it at the best places before because the okay. current girl that I go to in Moldova, she's really good. And she said, it doesn't matter which filler it is. It's the mm -hmm. technique. Yeah. And she oh, says, that makes I do, more sense. Yeah. Yeah. She says, I do all of it. I do Juvederm. I do Restylane. She says, everybody's happy because I just, I have the technique that I use on, on these fillers and, and it works. So well, I, I remember think, yeah, one of the sense. newer reps came to watch me do some injections on someone and I don't always do them the way that they show in the books. So right. I had one lady who had very deep lines here. So I put some in there and it just wasn't helping. So I put some in the other direction and I could see the reps, like her eyes going up, like, what are you doing? But it worked. Yeah. It's just like, I didn't want to say it in front of the patient, but I've never seen anyone do it that way before, but, but it worked. I'm like, yeah, well, my first job was a carpenter. So <laughs> you learn how to build things. So I'm like, I'm just trying to make this bigger and bigger and it's getting harder, but it's not doing what I want. So I needed some joices under that beam to build it back up. So you go in the other direction and build it up. But the technique makes a huge difference. You know, no, that's fair. I think no matter what you're using, if you use bad technique, it looks bad. If you use good technique, it looks good. That's fair. And last question that I want to ask that ties into really everything that we talked about. Mm -hmm. What should people look out for when they're choosing a plastic surgeon? So with plastic surgeons, we always say you want to find a board certified plastic surgeon, which is true in Canada, true in the U.S. Uh, that means that they've had the correct training. It means they've passed a written and an oral exam that shows that they're competent in what they're doing. And currently, I'm on a pilot program, but I think soon everyone's going to have to take a test every year. So uh, I'm one of the lucky few to volunteer for that. But instead of taking a big giant test every 10 years, they give you a smaller test every year. Um, and I think it's, it's helpful. Uh, but someone can be board certified and still not be a great surgeon. So it's not a hundred percent guarantee. I think it increases your odds of finding a great surgeon though. The okay. other thing that's helpful is with the internet, like you can look at the website, you can see what procedures they do. You can see if they've done it before. I still think it helps to see before and after pictures. Uh, I really, haven't had to use my little brag book anymore because everyone looks at them on the internet. Uh, I even have like the original iPad that has pictures on there. I, I just haven't updated it because I, I barely have to show it to people. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but seeing that they've done it before, I think is helpful. Uh, the other thing that can be helpful is talking to a patient who's had it done. So if you don't know someone, like I'll have patients who come in who they don't know anyone who's had a tummy tuck. You know, I'll have there's some patients that I have who will be happy to talk to them about them, let them know the good, the bad, and you know what was hard, what was easy. Uh, I think that helps too, not only in building some familiarity with the surgeon, but also with the procedure. And you'll know better how to take care of yourself afterwards. Uh, but you want someone who's experienced. You want someone who does the procedure with some frequency. Uh, and you want someone who can communicate. So once in a while I have a patient, I just, I just don't feel like what I'm saying is getting in and what they're asking me isn't making sense. So we have a communication issue. I would rather they see someone they can communicate with. So I would, I will tell them like, I, I, I feel like I could do a good job, but I don't feel like you're going to understand why I'm doing it. And that's going to make you uncomfortable and make your recovery harder. So there's a lot of good plastic surgeons around where I am. So I will like tell them that maybe you should see a couple more people in the area and see if there's someone that you feel like you can communicate with better because you'll have a better experience. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And how can people find you after, you know, listening to this episode, have a consultation with you or ask, you mm -hmm. know, any questions if they're considering a procedure with you? Yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> if you, even if you just Googled Dr. Mealy, I think I'd come up first. On the, the East uh, Bay, San Francisco Bay. Been here since 97, so I've been here a few years. Awesome. It's a great job, and I'm happy I can do it. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Mealy, and for sharing Thanks your for knowledge. Asking. I think we could have probably had another hour of, of a conversation because we only covered really a few procedures. There's so many more. I but talk a lot. Any, well, there's a lot to talk about, right? It's there not. Is. It's not an easy thing uh, and an easy field that you're in. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode. I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.